Okay, here we go. Um, let's see. Uh, we missed last week, uh, recording-wise. Uh, I'm just gonna skip it. We went real fast through some genealogy of Matthew. Uh, talked about the obedience of John. I'll go through that review uh, when I start talking about our lesson today. Uh, let me just jump into some announcements. Uh, last weekend, or the, yesterday, Saturday, we had uh, a mission opportunity in a town near us called Lorenzo. Uh, it's just eight miles to the east there, or to the west. Um, it was a good time. I'm grateful for the kids that showed up. They worked hard. They represented us well. Uh, it's a good feeling to see kids that you disciple um, ministering for the gospel. It's a good feeling. I want to thank those kids and let them know that they did a good job. And I'm very, 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 very proud of them. Uh, that was an excellent time. Uh, next thing, um, I'm going to be in a mission trip uh, to California. We're going to take some supplies. We're opening a church there in uh, San Marcos, California. Uh, we're going to take some supplies, do some prayer. Uh, hopefully there'll be some baptisms at the end and then we're gonna drive back. Got a quick little mission trip, well, quick, it should take a week. But in my absence next week, um, Adam, our uh, lead pastor here at our church, uh, will uh, come and give his testimony. If you'll remember, once a month, I try to have someone give a testimony just so the kids can hear a different voice besides mine and I also want them to see that in their walk everybody's walk is different uh, the experiences are different and I don't want them to get uh, discouraged just because their walk is not like mine or someone else's that they're listening to uh, so I'm going to do that it's going to be a good testimony uh, I'm very excited for what God will have to say there so let me open up in prayer and then we'll just get right into it before my little computer screen dies, I don't have my son back there anymore. All right. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. Uh, Father, bless the things that you uh, have to say to us tonight. Father, just uh, open our hearts, open our ears. Father, I just welcome your spirit here today to just speak to your people and uh, call them into a closer relationship with you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so to review, like I said, uh, last week we looked at chapter 1 and 2 of Matthew. I'm going to try and go a lot faster than I did when I was going through John, because I went through John, it took like a year and a half. And that's just not fair to youth age kids uh, that I do that. While, yes, I think every verse is important and there are gems to be gathered uh, at every point, there comes a time when you need to just recognize the audience that you're speaking to and move faster. So I'm going to try in an effort to do that. Uh, we covered chapters one and two last week. Uh, we looked at, we talked about Matthew, kind of the person he was, how like lists and documentation and things like that were very important to him, about he, how he often pointed out um, uh, fulfillments of prophecy in, in his effort to prove Christ as the Messiah. He went through the family bloodline uh, that linked him to all the appropriate people in prophecy. We talked about the importance of some of the women in those bloodlines and the biblical attitudes toward women. Tried to argue against sort of the common kind of uh, uh, disagreements that we seem to have in society about our attitudes toward women. Uh, we went real fast. And we talked about uh, the circumstances around Jesus' birth. And we looked at Joseph's obedience and how it was in him being humble, how him trying to do what's right and not embarrass uh, Mary and having him loving mercy and you know waiting and trying to be discreet about the problem that he thought he had with her and how he was walking humbly with his God and accepted God's will and put that in front of his feelings and it's in that obedience and in that obedient walk uh, that Christ was born. This guy, there's a reason he picked a crafty carpenter, broke carpenter, to be Jesus, the father, the earthly father of Christ. Uh, because he was doing what was right, loving mercy, and walking humbly with his God. 
And then we talked about some of the other circumstances around Christ's birth, how King Herod uh, killed a bunch of kid, kids kind of born in that age in an effort to kill Christ. And then we showed how sort of Moses' life mirrored that. And we talked about the obedience of Moses. And we talked about how if you live your life trying to do what's right, loving kindness, loving mercy, and walking humbly with your God, that your life too will also point other people to Christ. So we talked about the kind of opportunities that you get in the obedience that you have. You get to participate in doing great things with God. God will use you in that relationship to accomplish his will and his will is always great. So that was a review. Now I'm gonna kind of uh, run over chapter three and chapter four. A lot of that is like the introduction of John the Baptist and Jesus' baptism. We covered that back in John pretty extensively. Then we have the calling of the first four disciples. Um, that's gonna be covered in some other books that we're gonna cover next. And so I don't wanna spend too much time there. We're kind of move quickly through the book of Matthew. So I want to hone in here on chapter 5 with the Beatitudes. I'm going to camp out here in chapter 5 for a little bit. Even though I just got through saying we we're going to go fast, we're going to go do the first 12 verses. And considering the, the, the stuff that's here, I think that's going to be pretty quick. All right. So one day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Now, if you're a kid that goes to this church, this is what discipleship looks like. It should be someone that is experienced, that has some, that has some scars, that has some time spent in their walk with Christ, that's sitting down and telling you, like, hey, I've learned this in my walk. This could be me, this could be Pastor Adam, this could be uh, Tiffany or Moses or Wayne or any of the volunteers that we have here in our youth group. These people are here because they love you, because they want to share those experiences with you. And this is kind of like, sort of think of this like, if again, if LeBron James moved to Raw, and he was going to a basketball practice and he told everybody, hey, look, it's been my experience in playing basketball that you can't just dribble with your right hand. You also have to learn how to dribble with your left hand. And if you don't do that, it seems kind of not important right now, but if you don't do that, you're always going to be able to get pressed into trash by the defense. It's really going to hamper your offense. If you're not only going to be able to drive down one side of the court, you're going to be real ineffective. Any kind of motion on the other half of the court, it's going to hurt your game. He's better off now at a young age trying to learn how to dribble with your left hand. Now he's giving you advice based on experience and you're going to follow it. That's what discipleship looks like. Here's Christ discipling his, his followers. Okay, verse three. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, the poor and the mourn are not the main focus here. What those are are circumstances that God sometimes allows into your life to press you toward him. And what the purpose of that is, is so that you will realize your need for him. So really what he should be saying, that a different way to put this is, those that realize their need for him will be blessed. The kingdom of heaven is theirs and they will be comfortable. So it's not the, it's, it's recognizing your need for him. If you remember before, earlier, we've been talking about how part of being humble is having a contrite spirit. And that's recognizing, that's kind of a fancy church talk way of saying that I fall short regularly of these things that God has called me to. This doing what's right, loving and mercy, and walking humbly with my God. So when you fall short of those things, you can recognize your dependence with him, come on son recognize your dependence in him then you're not going to be arrogant you're going to be humble so these people humbly recognizing their need to lean in on him is an important part of receiving the blessings here in these beatitudes now verse 5 god blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the earth now here he is using words directly out of micah 6 8 when he, want, he calls us to walk humbly with him, 
And here he is saying, God will bless those who are humble. The other word that I want to concentrate on here besides humble is inherit. Now when I die, Gunner is going to inherit all of my guns. And by the time I die, that is allowed to be an obscene amount of guns that will instantly place him on some kind of FBI watch list. But he will inherit those, not because he's a good guy and he deserves them, but because of his position as my son. And so here we are, we see that the humble are the ones that will have the position to inherit the earth because it's in that humble walk with God that we demonstrate that we are children of God because we are doing what's right, loving kindness and loving mercy and, and walking humbly with our God. It's in that position of humbleness that we demonstrate our position as his children Therefore, being in a position to inherit the earth that God created for us. Verse 6. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. I don't have to refer to some of my notes here because I have some different. One of the things about the Bible is that uh, it comes in a lot of translations. Uh, I want to show you that justice is the same word wording as what we're saying in do what's right so in the new living translation micah 6 8 says uh, do what's right and love mercy in the esv it says to do justice and love kindness so you've heard me kind of mixing in kindness and mercy at the same time already and so in the new in the new king james version which is a, a nice solid version that I enjoy because I was raised on the old King James and many times some of the verses that I sort of say to myself, I learned as a kid in the King James. I can't say John 3, 16 without saying the these and thou to come in the King James version. Uh, they're just, God planted them in my heart that way, they've grown that way and I, I just leave them that way. Uh, but New King James says, do mercy, do justice and love mercy. So it's a little mix of both. All of these are good, fine, quality translations. Uh, the exact words aren't, the meaning is, but it's all the same. The exact word isn't really that important. But I want to show you that here he is, when talking about justice, he's talking about that, do what's right. So those who hunger and thirst for justice will be satisfied. Or they will be satisfied because God is going to aid them and give them the things that they need in their walk with him in order to do justice or to do what's right. So it won't be an unfulfilled need in your life. Okay, where are we at? Verse 7. God blesses those who are merciful. Here he is again. For they will be shown mercy. Here he is again, using word for word, the words that he calls us to in the Old Testament. And so one thing I want to remind you of is that it's in our acceptance of the mercy of Christ and it's in that overflow of God that's pouring his mercy out over us that gives us what we need in order to give mercy to other people. And it is in God that we're placing our trust so that we can, so that we are able to actually give that mercy away freely and without fear of consequence because we're trusting God and not trusting the person that we're giving the mercy to. And I want you to see that it's in both the Old Testament, whether it's an Old Testament prophet uh, describing how you're supposed to have your relationship with God, or whether it's the Son of God in the New Testament describing how you should have your relationship with God, these words are the same. He's calling us to the same thing. Okay? Now, here we go. Eight. Let's, let's combine eight and nine. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. Now, one of these things here, hearts that are pure and, 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 uh, and hearts that work for peace, that motivate you and drive you for peace, these are fruits of that relationship. If you live your life wanting to do what's right or wanting to seek justice, and you live your life want loving mercy or loving kindness, and you walk humbly, walking every day, walk humbly with your God, these are fruits that will be born in your life. You will have a heart that is pure. 
You will have a heart that strives for peace. And these will be fruits that will be born in our life to live in that relationship with God. Now, I want to combine this 10, 11, and 12 together and sort of point you back to some things that we've talked about before. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Now, this doesn't sound like a great future to look forward to, but what I want to remind you of is we've heard this before in John, and what we talked about was that he, all he's doing is telling you what the, what the future will be so that when you get there, you will recognize that you're on the right path. And with last time we talked about this, I was pointing to if someone stopped here at the youth building and asked for directions to get to the elementary school, I would say, okay, well, you get on this road right out here. You go all the way down till you meet the, till you come to the stop sign. On your left is going to be an awesome. If you want to turn left and go down that road, go all the way down that road. That's Main Street. It will dead end into a house. That street that it dead ends into is called 16th Street. Turn right. Go all the way down to the end of that street. You'll see the elementary school on the left. You can't miss it. So the person that gets my directions is going to get in the car. They're going to go down this road. They're going to come to a stop sign. They're going to look to the left. And they're going to see Ossips. And they're not going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe there's an Ossips right there. No. It's going to do two things. One, it's going to tell them they are on the right path. That they haven't veered from where they should have been. And two, it's going to tell them that I have been where I have told them to go. It's going to assure them. That, that their instructions and their directions are, are correct and that they are on the right path. So in that, there is assurance. The other thing that I want to point out to you is he's telling you, be happy about it. I want to remind you that this is not a punishment. When bad things, when you're walking in your walk with Christ, you're trying to do what's right, you're loving mercy, you're walking humbly with your God, and a bad thing starts happening. This is not, oh crap, I'm being punished. I must have messed up in some way. No. This is God drawing you nearer to Him. And so let me kind of uh, put this in a regular world uh, situation. So if you and your friend, y'all are right, you know, y'all are in school together, and y'all are just friends, you're just kind of, you know each other, you like each other, you hang out. But then all of a sudden, the two of you together go through this horrible experience. And the whole time, you and this other person, your fellow friend, y'all are the only two people that like stayed true to each other and didn't uh, believe whatever was going on with each other. And the two of you made it through that situation, came out on the other side of it, proved yourselves right, and all the bad things had come to an end. Now, that person isn't just kind of your friend that you like to hang out with anymore. That's your ride or die. That's your brother now, right? Your relationship with them is closer because of the hardship that you just went through together. God is calling you to that relationship with him when he allows those hardships to come into your life. And when you go through those, and God's alongside you the whole time, and he's faithful with you, and he's helping you, and he's listening to you, and he's giving you peace, and he's helping you work through these problems in your life, he becomes your ride or die. And that's what he wants to be. He doesn't just want to be an acquaintance that you talk to every once in a while on a Wednesday or a Sunday night. He wants to be your ride or die. He wants to be your best friend, not just your friend. So when these things come into your life, it's not a punishment. He's drawing you closer to him in those things. Look at the clothes. I want to kind of just point out that, again, whether it's an Old Testament prophet telling you what your relationship with Christ should be like, or whether it's the Son of God in the New Testament telling you what your relationship with God should be like, the words are the same. The thoughts are the same. The attitude is the same. This is what we need to be doing. We need to be striving to do what's right, to do justice. Striving to love mercy, to love kindness. Striving to walk, hum to walk every day and humbly with our God. If you're not in that walk yet, make the decision now to start that walk. 
You're, you're only wasting your life. Don't accept the, the false little plastic replacements that the world can try and give you for the real thing. Walk, join in that walk, commit to that walk, give your life to that walk. And if you're in that walk, commit to walk it better. We can all do that better. Let me pray for you in more close. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for these young people here today. Uh, Father, call them into a deeper relationship with you as they walk through this week. Uh, Father, show them that the replacements uh, that the world offers are just a hollow substitute for the real life offered by the real God. I pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.